Over the last session or two, we've been talking about uh, labor unions and uh, looked uh, specifically at uh, unfair labor practices and uh, both from the side of what are unfair labor practices from the employer, what are unfair labor practices from the union itself. Today we're going to take that discussion and really get into our home stretch, uh, if you will, of this class and, and, and finish up over the next couple periods or so. Uh, with uh, honing in on that information and on labor unions and today we're going to talk a little bit about the idea of collective bargaining. Now that is a term that that is used in uh, labor unions and if you're not familiar with the unions, if you've not had somebody in your family around a, a union, that term may be a little intimidating and yet it, it really shouldn't be because all of you have engaged in bargaining. Uh, if, if you gone somewhere where you've negotiated over the purchase of an automobile, you've engaged in bargaining. The only difference between regular negotiation, they call it bargaining, but the only difference between regular bargaining or negotiation and collective bargaining is that you are doing it on behalf of a group. And that's why we call it collective bargaining. And so for a little bit today, that's what we want to focus on. Now, collective bargaining, uh, if you will, is this process by which a union and an employer meet and they discuss and they negotiate with respect to wages. They may negotiate with respect to hours. They may negotiate uh, with respect to working con conditions, other terms and conditions of employment. And that's really what we're talking about when we say collective bargaining. It's just where the union and the employer meet and they negotiate over the terms and the conditions of the employment. Now, remember, most of uh, union um, ramifications are governed by, if you will, the National Labor Relations Act. Now, that's not true in every case, but generally, it's the National Labor Relations Act which governs union activity, employer activity with regard to unions. And so, specifically, if we focus on Section 8D of that uh, act, of the NLRA, it defines collective bargaining as this. It simply says, collective bargaining is the performance of the mutual obligation of the employer and the representative of the employees to meet at reasonable times and confer in good faith with respect to wages, hours, other terms, and conditions of employment or the negotiation of an agreement or any qu a question arising there under. Now, I'm not going to stop and reread that because at this point you'll have a, uh, on Blackboard a PowerPoint or should have a PowerPoint and specifically gives you uh, that definition, you hit pause and, and look at it. But a couple of key points out of there is you have to meet at reasonable times. In other words, the employer cannot insist that the union meet at 3 o'clock in the morning. And it's probably generally not going to be a considered a reasonable time. The other requirement is that you confer in good faith. So meet at reasonable times and confer in good faith with regard to those terms of wages that we were talking about. Um, that whole National Labor Relations Act requires, actually on both parties, the duty to bargain. All right, You have an actual duty to bargain or if you prefer a duty to negotiate. Uh, you don't have to negotiate if you're the employer. You don't have to negotiate with everybody. You simply have to negotiate with the recognized union. So under the National Labor Relations Act, an employer is required to recognize a union as the exclusive bargaining representative of its employees when a majority of those employees support the, re support the union. Now, go back a, a week or two ago when we were talking about labor unions and how you had a recognized union. And we went through the process of elections and how a particular union gets recognized. Keep in mind there may be different as we talked about then. There may be two or three organizations that want to represent a particular group of employees. But only one of those organizations can ultimately be picked as the union or as the official union or as the recognized union. And it is that union, once they're recognized, that the employer has to uh, negotiate with. Keep in mind, I've got to negotiate with them according to the process. Um, it is an unfair labor practice, as we may have talked about a couple weeks ago, to refuse to negotiate with them. So you have to do it. Uh, it is unfair labor practice for a union uh, to refuse to bargain with the employer. So it works both ways. But here is the key. It is simply the duty of collective bargaining is simply to bargain. It is not a duty 
to reach or get to a concession or an agreement. All right, let me say that again because I think that's really important. This duty to bargain and the union, it's collective bargaining because the union represents the employees, all right? So you've got a collective group that you're bargaining with. But this duty to bargain collectively is simply a duty to bargain. It is a duty to negotiate. It is not a duty to reach a decision. So as long as both sides are negotiating in good faith, if they don't come up to a decision, then that's, then that's the way it goes. I mean, that's a, there, there's no requirement that they actually have to reach a decision. The requirement is simply that they bargain in good faith. And as long as they bargain in good faith, um, that's what their duty is. Now, keep in mind a little more emphasis on this idea of collective bargaining. Once there is a recognized union, the employer has the duty to bargain with the union, not particular individual employees, all right? So again, that's why we call it collective bargaining. Because if I'm an employer and I have somebody that's, that's unhappy about a particular situation, uh, an employee, if you will, that's unhappy about a particular situation, my job as an employer, my duty as an employer is not to negotiate with that particular individual who is a member of the union, but my job as an employer is to negotiate with the actual union itself. Uh, give you a case, and, and you, you may have this on Blackboard as well, but there's a Supreme Court case referred to as Emporium Capwell Company. Again, that's Emporium Capwell Company versus Western Edition Community Organization. And in uh, Emporium operated, and you may have heard of them, they've operated a department store in the San Francisco area. And during, and, and they were union, uh, there was union employees, and the company had a collective bargaining agreement with the department store employees union. So you got a union out there that's the department store employees union, and you've got Emporia Capwell, who has a collective bargaining agreement with this department store employees union. The agreement set up a process, uh, the collective bargaining agreement set up a process for grievances, uh, set up a process to resolve claimed violations, including violations of employment discrimination. So the agreement itself, the collective bargaining agreement that was reached said, hey, here's the process that we're going to follow if a particular employee believes that they have been discriminated against. Well, there were two employees um, who believed that they had been, in fact, discriminated against. And so they took it upon themselves to uh, pick it to hold press conferences, and we'll talk about picketing in just a minute what that is, or a few, uh, maybe in a later session we'll talk about picketing. But these two employees took it upon themselves to meet with company officials, to hold press conferences, to, to picket, to pass out handbills urging customers not to patronize the store. And they were claiming, hey, we are being uh, discriminated against on the basis of our race, and therefore, we're going to do all these things. Pick it, we're going to hand out bills, we're going to hold press conferences, etc. The company basically said, you got to stop doing this. Our duty is to negotiate with the union. It is to follow the union's process that has been set up in the collective bargaining agreement, and that's the process that we're going to follow. And guys, if you don't like it, what we're going to do is, is going to fire you. We're going to terminate you. And in fact, they gave them those warnings. The employees did not stop. They continued to hold their press conferences. They continued to picket. They continued to pass out handbills. And basically, they were fired. And it went up to the court. And the issue was whether or not the National Labor Relations Board or Act protects activity by a group of minority employees uh, to bargain over issues of employment discrimination. And the court said no. The, the activity of these particular employees was not protected because there was a bargaining agreement and that was the process that they needed to go through. So trying to bargain on their own uh, is not protected by the National Rela Labor Relations Act. So keep in mind, if you're an employer, the employer holds, holds the duty to bargain in good faith, but not with individual members. That duty is to... Um, bargain with the recognized union.
All right, let's talk for just a minute. So what are some of these procedural requirements? Uh, what are the procedural requirements of the duty to bargain in good faith? If, if we know we've got a duty to bargain in good faith, whether we're a union or whether we're an employer, what requirements do we have to go through? Well, it's not like I can just knock on the door if I'm an employer or if I'm a union. I can't just knock on the door at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, we're going to bargain, we're going to bargain now, we're going to have a decision by 6 a.m. All right, It doesn't work that way. First of all, there has to be notice given. So if you're the union and you want to negotiate with the employer, you have to give the employer notice that you wish to collectively bargain at least 60 days before the end of a current collective bargaining agreement, if you have one, or 60 days up to the date the agreement will go into effect. Let me, let me back up on that and give you a little more explanation. Let's say that we're a union and employer and we already have a collective bargaining agreement. And when you write these collective bargaining agreements, you negotiate uh, terms of the conditions of the work. You also negotiate how long that bargaining agreement is going to last. Is it going to be one week? Never is. Is it going to be one year, two years, three years? What's the length of time that we're going to have that agreement? If I'm a union or an employer and I already have an agreement in place, then I have to give at least 60 days notice before that expiration or before that agreement expires in order to start negotiating again, uh, in order to begin that negotiation process. I can't just say, hey, I know our negotiation ends tomorrow, December 31st of whatever year. Uh, this is December 30th and I want you to start bargaining now. Okay, It doesn't work that way. We've got to give 60 days notice if there is in fact an agreement. If there is no agreement, then that 60 days takes place prior to the time the agreement will go into effect. So let's say I'm a brand new union, I've got an employer that I have to address, and I want the uh, agreement to be in place at the end of December 31. Then I have to negotiate or give notice 60 days before December 31 to say, I know we're the new union, we're gonna start negotiating, and here's the 60 days. The reason for that is, it kind of gives, um, it keeps an existing agreement if you have one in place for 60 days, but it, it gives time in order for strikes and lockouts uh, to be prohibited. In other words, we're going to negotiate this and we're going to do it in good faith and therefore we're not going to have strikes, we're not going to have lockouts, uh, things of that nature. We're going to have this cooling off period, if you will, that's really what it's for, uh, to negotiate in, within the 60 days. Now. If the negotiations result in a dispute, let's say uh, we can't come up to term on wages or, or we can't come to terms on the hours that we're going to work, then whoever wants to terminate the agreement um, has to notify an organization called the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Services, it's, uh, acronym FMCS. That's the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. And they basically have to tell them we're 30 days uh, from giving the notice to bargain. Okay, and so they have to say, "Hey, we got an issue here. We're not able to work it out, and so we're going to give you notice of what's going to happen." No strike or lockout can occur until after the 30 days from giving the notice has occurred, and and it can actually be longer periods of time in a healthcare institution. For instance, in a healthcare institution, you may have to give 90 days before uh, the expiration of an agreement or before an agreement goes into effect. But in any event, if you get there and you're working and you've given your notice but you can't come to an agreement, then uh, let's say it's the employer and says, look, we've worked with you, department store uh, union, for a long time. We're, we, we're not going to reach an agreement. Uh, we're at dispute. We're going to go ahead and terminate the agreement. Before they can actually do that, they have to notify the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service and try to let them work out some kind of agreement. Now, um, the court or the NLRB doesn't really provide a means of having the court review uh, a certification decision as to whether the union is recognized or not. Uh, there, there's actually a case out there, uh, we may put it in your Blackboard board material, that an employer recognized uh, a union and dealt with them, came to an agreement with them, 
And then after they came to that agreement, had it signed, in effect, everything, uh, the employer said, you know what, we don't think you're really a recognized union that we have to bargain with in the first place. And the court said, too late. You already recognized them. You've already entered into an agreement with them. You can't now say uh, that they weren't official when, in fact, everything you needed to know to make your claim that they weren't official or they weren't a recognized union was already at your disposal when you entered into negotiations with them. So keep in mind, if they're certified as the winner of a representation, if they're recognized as a union, the employer must, um, must collectively bargain with them. Now, how long does that duty, you know, we know that we have a duty to bargain, and, to bargain. We know that we have a duty, whether we're the employer or the union, to bargain not only to negotiate, but to bargain in good faith, all right? So the question becomes, well, how long do I have to negotiate? How long do I have to um, bargain? When the union is certified as a bargaining representative, uh, the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, requires that the employer recognize and bargain with the union for at least a year from certification, regardless of any doubts the employer may have had about the union's support. All right, so they have to do it for at least a year. When an agreement exists, then the employer must bargain with the union for the terms of the agreement. For instance, many times when you have an agreement between the employer and the union, you've come to a collective bargaining agreement, it specifies exactly how long you have to negotiate, and there's a period of time. And if the agreement provides that period of time, you have to follow um, that period of time. All right. If the union acquires bargaining rights by what we, we referred to last time as voluntary recognition, then the employer is required to recognize and bargain for only a reasonable period of time. And, and let's go back just kind of by way of reminder. You, you remember one of the ways the union can be recognized is by an election. And we dealt with that and we're not going to cover that again. But one of the ways, as we touched upon briefly, that a union can be recognized is the employer can just say, we're going to recognize you. Let's say somebody comes in, let's say a plumbing group comes in and says, uh, we want to be recognized as a union. We can go through an election, but we're the only ones on board. You know that. We're the only ones around here. Why don't you just recognize us? Uh, and the employer may agree to do so. And if they do, then they are only required to bargain with them for a reasonable period of time. Whereas if they've gone, if that union has gone through an election process, remember, it's at least a year. Um, if an agreement has been reached, then after, after the voluntary recognition, then it's whatever the terms of the agreement is. So if you're trying to negotiate to come up with an agreement and you've got a voluntarily recognized union, it's only for a reasonable period of time. But once, um, once that agreement has been reached, then it's for the entire duration of the, uh, of the agreement, if you will, all right? The nature, a little bit about this nature of the duty uh, to bargain in good faith. Again, it is only, and I can't emphasize enough, the requirement is that you bargain in good faith, not that you reach an agreement. The specific language under the NLRB is that the parties in their negotiations with an open and fair mind and a sincere purpose to find a basis of an agreement. Okay? You are not engaged, if you're an employer, um, you're not engaged in good faith bargaining if you say, well, I'm going to go sit to the, at the table, but I'm not going to do anything about it. I mean, it's kind of the, the old kid attitude, if you will. You can, you can put dinner in front of me, but you can't make me eat. Well, that won't fly with the National Labor Relations Board. And so the duty is to bargain in good faith. You have to have an open and fair mind, and you have to have a sincere purpose to find a basis for the agreement. Now, what happens if you can't reach an agreement? And sometimes that happens. It is what we call an impasse. And you may have this on your screen, but it's I-M-P-A-S-S-E. We call it an impasse. And it is simply a deadlock in negotiations. Uh, both sides have bargained. Both sides cannot come to an agreement. We've got uh, a deadlock. Uh, if you have a criminal trial and the, there's a mistrial because the, the jury can't come to an agreement or a unanimous agreement, you have a mistrial or a deadlock. 
the jury's deadlocked. Well, the same thing with bargaining. You have a deadlock in negotiations. They've just come to terms. Uh, the employer may say, hey, we absolutely need five hour or five days a week. And the union may say, no, we absolutely insist on four days a week uh, as a working requirement. And there's that impasse. Uh, when the impasse results uh, from a particular uh, proposal, it is not a violation of the duty to bargain if it relates to wages, hours, or terms and conditions of, of employment. So an impasse is not, that just means you haven't come to an agreement. That's all that means. If, however, an employer engages in conduct indicating a lack of good faith, then the employer has violated that duty to negotiate in good faith. All right? It also, that duty to bargain in good faith also includes the obligation to execute a written agreement. So let's say that the parties have negotiated and they say, here are our terms and everybody agrees to that. The employer cannot say, well, we'll agree to that, but we're not going to put it in writing. Okay? Or the union can't say, you know, we'll agree to that, but we're not going to put it in writing. Now, if they've reached an agreement, the law absolutely requires uh, the parties to put their agreement into writing. And almost always uh, agreements are put into writing. So that kind of gives you this idea of what collective bargaining is. It, it gives you the idea of how you have to do it in terms of good faith, how long it has to last, what notice you have to give, and kind of the nature of it. The question then becomes, all right, this, this idea of collective bargaining is we're bargaining over something. What is it that we actually have to bargain over? What are the bargaining subjects? Well, we're going to break that down. Bargaining subjects can be broken down into three uh, main areas. You can basically have what we call mandatory bargaining subjects, all right, mandatory bargaining subjects. You can also have what we call permissive bargaining subjects. And then you can have simply illegal bargaining subjects. And those topics sound exactly uh, or are exactly what the, the, way, the way they sound. Let's, let's look at mandatory bargaining subjects first. Mandatory bargaining subjects, mandatory bargaining subjects are those matters that vitally affect the terms and conditions of employment in the bargaining unit. The parties must bargain in good faith, absolutely have to bargain in good faith over these topics. Now, the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, the courts, they've in broadly interpreted these matters to being related to wages, hours, terms and conditions of employment. All right? So you have wages, you have hours, you have terms and conditions of employment. I have to bargain over those things. Give you some examples of those. Severance pay, all right? Um, must discuss the effects of, uh, as an employer, I have to discuss the effects of such decisions with the union. If, if we're going to have severance pay, I've got to discuss it. Uh, whether or not we have transfer policies, how I can move one per employee to another uh, particular, from one job to another job. Uh, retraining, the procedure to be used for layoffs, if you will. If I'm going to decide to lay off, what procedure do I use? How do I decide who gets um, laid off or who doesn't get laid off? Those are mainly what we call mandatory bargaining subjects. And those relate frequently to hours, frequently to wages, and other terms and conditions of employment. Then there are those areas that are simply permissive bargaining subjects. Um, we can talk about them, but we're not required. And in fact, if that's the only thing standing in the way of a collective bargaining agreement, it would actually be a violation of the duty to bargain in good faith to insist upon one of these permissive bargaining subjects to be made part of the contract. So let me say that in another way. Let's say a union and, em and an employer have come together. They, they've reached agreement on hours. They've reached agreement on wages. They've reached agreement on terms. But there are a couple of other areas that they've not reached an agreement upon. If, as an employer, I absolutely insist that the union agrees with me on these particular topics, then I am violating the duty to bargain in good faith because they're not mandatory uh, bargaining subjects. So we're talking about permissive bargaining subjects. Permissive bargaining subjects are simply those matters that aren't mandatory, but they're not illegal. Uh, the parties may, but they're not required to bargain over such subjects. And that's why they call it permissive uh, bargaining subjects. Examples of that may be, what is the procedure for ratifying a contract? In other words, the collective, the employer and the union may come together and have an agreement, 
but that agreement may still be subject to the members of the union voting on it. So how does the union representative go back to the um, in its union members and get the contract ratified? Well, an employer can't sit around and say, well, this is the procedure you're going to use, and if you don't use this procedure, then we're not going to have an agreement at all. That would be a permissive bargaining subject. What's the procedure for ratifying the contract? The court says that's permissive, and the employer cannot insist upon that to the point of an impasse. Uh, other examples of permissive items, attempting to modify the union certification, uh, strike settlement agreements, um, corporate activities or social activities. A union can't come in and say, okay, we've agreed to wages, hours, and uh, other terms and conditions of employment, but as a matter of this bargaining agreement, you also have to put in a provision of how much time or how much money you're going to donate to this particular charitable activity. The union can't insist upon that. That's a permissive bargaining subject, but it can't result in a deadlock, if you will. Um, likewise, requiring a transcript of all bargaining sessions. All right, That would be a permissive item. Frequently what happens, uh, particularly in sports uh, negotiations, but really in all negotiations of collective bargaining, you may have transcripts being taken of what of what's going on. You have union representatives in the room, you have employer representatives in the room, and you may have a what we call a court reporter or a transcriptionist sitting there typing everything as it's being said and by who it's being said. There may be six people in the room and that transcriptionist is saying this is what person A, B, C, D, and E said and go through that. Some people some want that as part of their agreement. The court says you can have that, but that's only a permissive bargaining subject. So you have what's called mandatory, you have what's called permissive, and then you simply have prohibited bargaining subjects. And those are the ones that are illegal, if you will, or simply prohibited. Uh, there are proposals that involve violations of the NLRA or other laws. In other words, if the National Labor Relations Act has a particular uh, provision in it that says you can't do X, then for you to try to bargain over what X is, and say, yeah, we can do it under these circumstances, that would be prohibited. The court says, we've already decided on that, we've already made law, you can't change that. So any attempt to bargain over a prohibited subject is going to violate uh, the National Labor Relations Act. Any agreement reached on an item that if, if it's prohibited, even though the parties agree to it, that agreement is not enforceable, and either one can attack it later on. Um, maybe subjects may not be used to say we're not going to come to an or we're not going to come to an agreement because we didn't reach an agreement on this this thing which is prohibited and probably makes common sense but in the same way that the courts say you cannot use permissive subjects to be the basis of an impasse uh, clearly the courts are saying you can't use prohibited bargaining subjects to be the basis of an impasse as well. So you've got to be careful about that. You've got mandatory subjects, which you have to bargain over. You have permissive subjects, which the union and the uh, employer may choose to bargain over, but are not required to. And then you simply have what are called um, prohibited bargaining subjects. And so that's kind of, that's kind of the nature uh, of that. Now, during this bargaining process, and as part of this good faith, and the, each side may have to furnish certain information. So let's say that we've got an employer who says, you know what, we understand that wages are a mandatory bargaining issue. And here's the deal. We're happy to negotiate with you over wages. But you, you've got to understand, we simply don't have the money at this plant to be able to afford the $30 hour wage that you want. We can afford 15, but we simply don't have um, the, the money to do that. Court says, you know what, you can say that, but you have to provide information if the union demands it. So if you're gonna stand back as an employer and you're gonna say you can't afford a particular wage, if the union insists upon finding out what that information is, you have to provide it. Uh, give you an example. Uh, employer has a duty to furnish wage scales. 
all right, what are the wage scales? A, uh, an employer has a duty to show the factors that it considers into when entering into compensation and how much they pay and, and what they look at. What are those factors? Job rates, um, job classifications, statistical data on employment minority practices uh, or in how many minorities they employ. Uh, list of names and addresses of the employees in a particular unit. All right. So that's information that during this process the employer absolutely has to provide in order to bargain in good faith and in order as part of their mandatory bargaining. So that gives you kind of a breakdown on the collective bargaining, the good faith, uh, the mandatory subjects, permissive subjects, prohibited subjects. So we go through all that. What if we do in fact come to an impasse or what if there is some kind of violation? If that occurs, then there are certain remedies uh, that the NLRB and the courts have set out. Remember, the duty to bargain is good faith, but it's not to reach an agreement. So the board, the National Labor Relations Board, cannot require that parties make concessions or reach an agreement. If the union is insisting on 30 hour or $30 an hour as a wage, and the employer is insisting on $25 an hour as a wage, the, the National Labor Relations Board can't come in and say, you know what, employer, you've got to come to $30. They can't come in and say, you know what, union, you've got to come down to $25. They can't come in and say, guess what, guys, we're going to split the difference and it's going to be $27.5 or whatever that, that may be. The board simply can't require the parties make concessions. Now, what the board can do, the National Labor Relations Board can do, is required that the parties return to the bargaining table and make another effort to explore the basis for an agreement. So if they can do that, that's, that's part of the requirement. Now, give you a couple of exceptions. When the violation involves specific practices like the refusal to furnish information or to sign an already agreed upon contract, the board can say, no, you're going to do that. All right. If the employer doesn't want to pro provide information, the board can make them provide information. Uh, if there's illegally made unilateral changes, the board is or the employer said we're just not going to honor that anymore. The board can say, no, you've already had an agreement. You're going to honor it. Um, if it appears, and there's evidence to support that one of the sides is refusing to negotiate seriously with the other side then the board can in fact issue a cease and desist, tell the offending party, whether it be the employer or the union, to stop the illegal conduct and then go back and negotiate in good faith. But at the, at the end of the day, the only thing the employer can do is to require the parties to negotiate in good faith. That's kind of a picture of the collective bargaining aspect of it. Um, once you've got these recognized unions, the employer and the union have this duty to come together and collectively bargain, collectively negotiate, but they don't have to reach an agreement. Next time I will, we'll focus on, okay, well, you have an agreement or the parties can't reach an agreement, what happens there? And that's where you get into strikes and picketing and lockouts, and we'll talk about that in the next class period.